Um, we've captured a little bit of what it's like behind the scenes when we go and do these stories. You'd understand that going into um, Iraq and Baghdad, not an easy mission to do. Number one, you get to fly in commercially now, which is interesting from the previous times I've been in there, so the airport works fine. We had to wear body armour for a while. We had four vehicles that were armour-plated. I mean, the windows, you tap them, they feel like concrete. Uh, and a security team, fully armed security team. It might seem a little over the top, but any media, anyone doing business there of any kind, any sort of visitor, you need to be protected and, and, and travel in armoured vehicles. So this is, it's just for the run in, because the Baghdad, the main road from the airport to the centre of the city was, during the war, the most dangerous road on earth. It's got a lot easier now to travel on, but this is just a safety measure. We won't be wearing these all the time, but they insist that we, uh, as the cars are armoured, they want us armoured and protected as well. So we suited up, we armoured up. Um, it made moving around Baghdad extremely difficult. Um, the checkpoints are all still in place. The American military don't arm them anymore, but the Iraqi army and the Iraqi police and the various Iraqi security forces do. So we went to do an interview at one of Saddam's palaces, which are now owned by the government, and the government has all their ministers and deputy prime ministers in them. And we had to strip down, essentially, and go into one armoured vehicle and squeeze into the back of this big armoured land cruiser to, to get into this place, which um, made it hard, because it was an hour and a half through checkpoints just to get to this one meeting. Yeah. I see Jamal there in the front. Right, here we are, squeezed in. This is um, what it takes to go into a place called the International Zone, which is about as secure as you get in Baghdad. We're going to go and interview the Deputy Prime Minister, but we've had to strip down to one vehicle, the barest amount of gear that we could fit in this car, and just the, the minimum group that we need to go in and do that interview. And we're hoping that all the right permissions are there, that all the right approvals there. It's taken a long time to work this one out, so... We've been here for the past 10 days or so. We're about to leave, we're packing up. Here's all the gear that we travel with and believe it or not, that's a fairly light kit. We had to cut the amount of equipment down to do this kind of journey. The security guys that we use are over here just having a final briefing before we head off uh, to the airport. We've been traveling in four of these vehicles uh, they're all armoured. There's no direct threat that media or Westerners are going to be bombed here, but there's a lot of random violence. You're still a target, so we had to take all sorts of precautions. This area where we're here, I'll just give you a guided tour. Have a look at this fantastic mosque over here. This is the hotel we've been staying in, the Ishtar. It, it once was called a Sheraton. <laughs> and this is quite a notorious hotel. The story goes around here that Uday Hussein, Saddam's son, used to enjoy partying up at the top here. There's a nightclub and there was a wedding here once and in quite some gruesome detail the locals will tell you that Uday came and found the bride, took her for himself and threw the groom, her husband, off the balcony straight down into this car park. This other hotel over here has some quite some history. It's called the Palestine. I've stayed here before in 2003 and 2004. There was a Reuters news agency cameraman on the edge of this balcony who was had the camera on his tripod during the, the peak of the conflict, getting some vision out this way in Baghdad. And uh, a tank round was fired at him, blew the balcony off and obviously killed him. I, I think generally Australians have stop thinking about what may or may not be going on here, yet we invested so much here with our military and expertise. It's been fascinating. I've met some wonderful locals who've invited me into their homes. I've met the government officials. The overriding sense I get is that there is a lot of hope, a lot of optimism, but surprisingly they tell me here that the war never ended. But I um, hope you've enjoyed a bit of a look around about how we operate, where we stay and how we go about doing these stories.